All right. Clap one on three. One, two, three. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're so glad that you're here. As always, I am your host, Lauren Ash. And as always, I am joined by my co-hostess with the most S, Christy Oxborough. How are you feeling? I'm doing great. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. I mean, we're uh, we're ahead of the game for when this is actually going to um, release. Yeah. But summer is like sort of winding down mm -hmm. at this point. Mm hmm. And I'm now realizing just how many things I've put my children in in the summer, thinking they'll love this. That's fun. This is a good way to spend time without the idea of, oh, I actually have to get them to and from the activity. And sometimes I have to sit there. Son of a bitch. Like, yeah. I, that's a thing you don't think about in advance. Yeah. So I'm I'm pumped for that to stop. Right. They're having a great time. Hey, but gas is expensive and mama's tired. You I know what that. I mean? You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm, uh, I'm ready for just a small vacation. A, va a summer vacation from summer vacation. Yeah. 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 I think I should be getting to the habit of maybe taking the first week of school off so that they go to school and then I can just do fuck all for like the whole time they're gone. Right. That'd be great. Yeah. But I can't think of back to school yet because then I got to get the supplies and I got to label them and put the get the new clothes. And I can't. That's later me's problem. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. Um, no. It is. Uh, it is a vicious cycle. It is. Because. Calendar soon, oh, yes. Because soon yeah. after that, suddenly I'll start going, ah, crap, we got a birthday coming up. And then before you know it, it's Christmas. You know, people have started making comments. I don't know if you've noticed this on social media and stuff where it's like, I only have, you know, 45 summers left in my life or whatever. Like this idea. Mm. Now, of course, no one knows when they're going to die. Of course. Uh, they may only have three left. Why would I say that? It's a true crime podcast. <laughs> um, you think it's bad. It could be worse. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Which, listen, that's not me trying to be negative. Uh, and God forbid anything happened to anybody like that. But you know what I'm saying? It's like, I yeah. feel like we can't, can't, you gotta, you gotta just be, every day's a gift um, for sure. But yeah, I, I, when I start, and also when I start thinking about it in those terms, I'm like, that is depressing to think about when you're a yes. child, you have, but then I love this. I'm like, oh, the idea that I, we only have 80 summers, 80 ish. I mean, we'll live, uh, God forbid, we live longer than at eight, to 80, but you know what I mean? I'm, I'm saying that feels like an average age. Sure. Even 100, you only get 100 summers. Like, doesn't that feel low ultimately? It does. Right? It does. I mean, um, I, I'll, have eaten, I'll have eaten thousands of double cheeseburgers <laughs> in this life. Thousands. Yeah. But yeah. again, only you only get, you know, 100 summers if you're lucky. Yeah. Oh, I, I get it. I have not heard it that way specifically. I've heard um, the people online that are like, you only get 18 summers with your kids. Oh, to sure. To give we you like a- to We have give different you... algorithms. <laughs> <laughs> we really do. Uh, to give you like a very depressing, like you only have, to quote Eminem, you only have one shot, one opportunity. Yeah. Um. So it's just that whole like, well- are you gonna what are you gonna do this summer with your kids because before you know it they're gonna move out and not do anything and whatever and look I've I've taken it to heart where I mean we did the whole like all of us family vacation to California to visit you last year uh in the winter and then this summer I was like I'm like god knows I'd love to make that an annual thing but I'm like we want something a little more cost efficient i yeah, guess but I, I was like yeah so i was like let's let's do something all of us and i was like i don't think the older one's gonna want to go but we'll offer it either way um it took him a long time to decide if he was gonna go and then he finally was like yeah i'll come maybe he saw one of my one of my algorithms you only get so many summers you know what i mean like <laughs> well he's probably seeing ones that are like you only get 40 summers with your ma and he's yeah. just like, I yeah. can't. Yeah. So the point is, yeah, all five of us are going off on an adventure 
in a few weeks. I mean, by the time this releases, we'll have done it. Um, couldn't be more excited. Yeah. They're all, they're all jazzed, mainly because they just got to sit in the back of the car. They don't have to actually drive any yeah. of the amount of or pay for anything. Uh, God, you really do only get 18 summers. Uh, like as a child, <laughs> as a child with that, like you you make sure you have something to do in the car and then you just go. Usually someone else is packing your shit and they plan out whatever the hell you're going to do. It's just, I, I did, I did the other day say to one of my kids, wait till someday when you have kids. I, well, I always say if you have kids, cause I don't want to put pressure on them to th make them think they have to. But I was like, if you ever have kids, just think someday you're going to be in this position. But you're going to be in the other one where all of a sudden you're like, oh, my God. Who's it, am, was somebody else getting all this shit? Like I went to go on a camping trip with a friend. But all of a sudden, like I had all my stuff ready. And it's like, who do you think got your stuff ready? Who do you think planned out everything? And I was like, someday, if you have kids, you're going to realize, oh, shit, there's so much more work than you think. Yeah. And they're like, oh, yeah, I know. And I'm like, we'll see. Because oh, they don't know. They don't know. They don't know. No, they have they have no idea because they think it's just going to be like a like they think the vacation is just like I chose a, a time and a place and away we go and let's just flibberty gibbet our way through it and have fun. And it's like, oh, no, somebody had to go online, figure out where we were going, what we were going to do, what hotel was closest to that to cut down on the driving and then what are we going to do next? And where are we doing this? And where are we going to eat? Like all of these things had to be figured out. He, They think it's going to be just like off the top of my head. No. Yeah. I mean, it might prove them. It might, it might prove them wrong when they find out mama busts out her little notebook with, with the notes that she took from the internet uh, to make their life uh, a little easier. That will be the moment they're like, okay, so she's not just making this up. You know, that's a class. Why don't they teach logistics to us yeah. growing up? You know, we people often talk about like there should be a class where they teach you how to do your taxes. I stand by that. Yes. That should be mandatory. That that would be, I mean, that being said, it would be a class I likely would fail. Um, oh, yeah. I would not have passed that. No. Uh, I remember um, Mother Laurel, uh, she once sat me down uh, to explain my taxes to me. To like walk me through. And it was literally, and I am not kidding or exaggerating. It was like she was speaking another language. Mm. It's like, I don't know what this alien speak is, but it is not of this world, mother. Um, yeah, it just doesn't compute for me. There are certain things that sure. just don't compute. Uh, and it's usually to do with numbers, which is interesting because I did win a math award in high school. No big deal. <laughs> kind of a big deal. Um but there's certain options, but it was just general math. It's when you get into the sp these specific things. It's yeah. like, I don't know where you're going with this. But all of this is to say, um, so yeah, there could be a class like like the real life things that they should teach you, like doing your taxes, yes. all those things. Logistics, I think, is an interesting one because I don't think there is any class that teaches kids that. And I feel like it's something for me that I, I also, now granted, Christy is without a doubt, way more organized than I am. And that is, that is a truth. I'm not being self-deprecating. What I will say is I think I also am good at logistics. I'm just not good yeah. at like keeping track, keeping sure. notes, not losing things. Like this is, this sure. is when I hyper-focus, I can plan the hell out of a trip. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah. Um, I know where we're going. I know where we're staying. I know I have all of the pieces that, that same kind of thing. Yeah. But then I think it's like, how did we learn this? I think it right? just comes natural to some people. I think so. I think that there's people who do or people that don't. Because there's been people in my life, other people in my life that are like, how did you do all this? Another example, when I was releasing music, people were like, yeah. people in the industry would say to me, how did you do that? And I was like, I just Googled. Like, I just taught myself. Like, mm -hmm. it's all there. Mm -hmm. you, you can pretty much figure out anything. When I moved, this is, seems like a simple one, but when I moved from Chicago back to Toronto, it was like, there's a lot of shit you have to do to make one of those moves like in a yeah. truck. 
how did you figure it out? I just did. And that's, again, to your point, I guess, I guess maybe there are people who really shine in that area and people who maybe it's more of a challenge, but I feel like there could be like a, just basic logistics yeah, that you could teach kids that I think would be helpful. Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, I would nail that class FYI. Um, I also would have loved it. I think, um, a taxes class would have come in handy. I wouldn't have been good at it because I wasn't even uh, good at regular math. I do remind you that when I started university, it was with the intent to get an accounting degree. I I wasn't going to bring it up, but yeah. yeah. And I only got so far into it and I was like, I hate this. Like this is I I just I don't numbers is not a thing I ever want to have to deal with intentionally. And then we don't have to get into this here, but like, have you unpacked like what inspired that? Like, why did you? Oh, I know exactly why I okay. did that one because I was basically told that's what I was going to do. Got it. Because I was told that was pretty much the only acceptable career that I could go into. Well, spoiler alert. Not true. You well, could have been a naked baker. You could have been <laughs> a, a snake wrangler. Um, I like how many ache words there were in that. I don't snake know what's bake, going on. Bacon? I've had a half like a glass it. of wine and I'm buzzing. Uh, well, yeah, well, look, uh, it, it came as a real shock. Uh, yeah. For, to go from uh, that's what you have to do to being told, oh, yeah, by the way, I've changed the major that I'm doing. And I got a real, I got a real pushback on that. Even after I graduated. Um, but you know what? I'm using my current degree. So that's something. Yep. Exactly. Absolutely. And, I, and it doesn't involve numbers, which is nice. Sometimes it involves me having to speak words from other languages. And that's tough. Yeah. You know, spoiler alert to this episode. Um, but uh, you know what? I'm I'm doing my best. You're doing great. Yeah. You're doing great. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. Uh it's interesting the journey. What this was the statement I was about to make in earnest. Mm -hmm. It's interesting the journeys we all take in life. Like, where is that going? <laughs> That, well, that, that's not light. That's not bantor. What I, is that? I, I see your energy and yeah. I'm, I match it with uh, ever since you like minutes ago said naked baker. I can't stop thinking about how I would absolutely fail at that because I'd go to lean forward and my boobs would just start kneading the dough and I'd be like, son of a bitch. Like, and I'd, I'd be pulling them back in and oh, yeah, that focaccia would also have gone on a journey. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> that focaccia would get you? No. Yeah. No. Listen, thank you. Thank you for bringing that back. I mean, I think a naked baker would be allowed to wear an apron. I hope so. It yeah. would have to be a pretty... There would have to be, like, almost a bra-like situation at the top, because when there's when there's not... Gravity's not kind. And I think maybe there's some gravity in baking. Is there? Yeah, I think there space is space baking. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I have not had half a glass of wine. That's a shame. That's a shame for me. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, baking is science. Baking is science. Sure. You know what I mean? Cooking, uh, cooking art, baking oh. science. So Which naked is science is what naked we're... science. Well, Christy, she's a science nerd. She is, but she's fully clothed. Okay. Because I, I just don't think. I don't even want to, I don't even, I don't even want to be naked when I shower. <laughs> I am, I will, but I'd like to, like, if I could go through life never being naked. Great. You're a Tobias Funke. I am. Um, the joke is, if I could go life without ever wearing a bra again, mm -hmm. blessed. Yeah. I'm living a blessed life. Um, but but just let me let me have clothing. Right. I just I need something uh I 
I'm like a house being fumigated for roaches. Let me have a tent. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I roach that. free. I'm just, I don't know why I said it, but I'm absolutely roach free. It's just, I don't know. I just, just let me have clothes. Like I've never been one. I, I prefer socks more often than not. Yeah. I just always would like to have a, have a piece of clothing on. ABC, always be clothed. Thank you so much. Oh, I like yeah. that. Yeah. I also probably would have fucked that up and all said like, always be clothing. What? Where always be clothed is literally right there. It is right there. It is right there. It's a low hanging fruit. Oh, like not tits. to be confused with your low hanging fruits. <laughs> My low hanging melons. Yeah. Uh, it happens to the best of us. I think it happens to all of us. Oh, it does. It does. It's just, God, one day you're, you're 22 and you're so proud of the rack you were given. And then one day you're 42 and you're picking them up off the floor and throwing them over your shoulder to walk up a set of stairs. <laughs> that, you know what? That's the video that should be in my algorithm, which is <laughs> you've only got 10 yeah. summers with that high sitting rack. Enjoy yeah. it while you can. Yeah. Let me tell you a little something. They talk about having kids and, and all of that and, and, and what that can do. I am a woman. I've never had a child. I've never breastfed. And guess what? These things, they're moving. Yep. They're moving. They're making like some older people from Canada and they're moving down south. <laughs> <laughs> Your tits are snowbirds. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they really are. It doesn't even take children. Like children alone. No. Uh, are not going to do it. Uh, it will happen. I mean, children, they don't mean to, but they're they are going to make it worse and they're going to cause some things that uh, shouldn't happen naturally, but gravity is just going to come up. And yeah, like not, not to scare the young people, but there should be someone who approaches like 20 year olds and is like, just a heads up, like, like, you know, the super supportive girl in a bathroom to all the drunk girls. There needs to be like, I love that I'm saying it this way, an old crone that's like sitting in that bathroom. And when those girls come in and are looking at themselves in the mirror, just be like, beautiful. Just a reminder. This will fade. You'll always be beautiful in another way. But do with that now what you want. Yeah. Look, again, if I could go back in time... And tell my younger self, walk around naked now. I would. Maybe in some ways, my destiny is to be that old, old crone in a bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> bathroom crone on your resume. Um, this is now turning into Moira Rose from Schitt's Creek, mm. who told uh, Stevie on the show um, that... While she's still young, she should take nude photos of herself to remember, like, when she's older. And I'm like, oh, I, I tell I'm telling you, I would have hated that. Like, See, I would have hated hearing that, and I would have hated doing it. Here's the thing. I yeah. am convinced that they somehow got that from me, because I have been saying this for years, yeah. years and years. Um, and I do stand by that. I do stand sure. by that. Look, well, I hear I could you're, never a never you're a never I nude. You're a never nude. I am a never. You don't want to be photographed naked, and that's your prerogative. I'm simply saying, you know, here's the thing, because because look, in 20 years, you'll look yeah. back at this time and go, she was banging. Oh, it's absolutely the. I don't. I'm sure there's an exact phrase, but it's something about like. I wish. Oh, God. I wish I was the size that I was the first time I ever looked at myself and said, oh, she's fat. Oh, yeah. Because it's like the the difference between then and there. And I mean, weight should not matter in, in the course of the world. Um, but it's just one of those like you don't know when you're in it. 
it's when you get out of it that you look back and go, oh, yeah, that wasn't so bad. Like I had a shirt when I was 19 that it didn't matter what was going on. When I put that shirt on, banging, to use your word. It was the best shirt I ever owned. It was like I received so many compliments wearing that shirt. And like I what? went with a with a girl. I, can't, I love that I can't remember who, but I went shopping with this girl because we were like, we're going to go out tonight. Let's buy shirts because we need a going out top. It was the early 2000s. Leave us alone. Um, and so we were like, hey, we're, we're going to get tops. And I got this. It's this black shirt that had like a, a, a V, but but not too deep, but deep enough that my just a basic bra could lift the ladies enough that it was a nice cleave, uh, long, like a three quarter sleeve. And so I was like, here we go. And I put it on and it was black. So it was very slimming. And I was like, oh, I love this shirt. Um, and I was like, what do you think? And the girl I was with was like, oh, I think that's great. You should like totally buy that. So I was like, great. So we, this was like, go buy the shirt, go to the girl's house. And then we're going to change into these shirts and then we're going to pre-drink and then we're going to go out. And her boyfriend was at her house at the time. And I came out of the bathroom wearing this shirt and he went, did you just pick that out today? And I went, I did. And he went, great choice. And I've never been more flattered in my life. I was like, that is, thank you very much. Yeah. Every time I see photos of that shirt, I always go, God, I love that shirt. Where did you it go? Still, I'm I just going to say, no you concept. still have the shirt? Because I, I remember have, that shirt. I have no idea where it went. We got to find that shirt. Yeah. I was talking, well, I was talking to my husband the other night. I was explaining Oh, I think I was talking about uh, telling a story about how him and I met. And I was like, oh, I couldn't remember the like exact time frame. And he's like, well, we, there somebody who was there that night took a photo of the two of us, even though we didn't really interact very much. So it was weird that the two of us are in this photo. And he was like, there's that a picture of us. You can find it and timestamp it and remember the day we met. And I was like, cool. And I found the photo and I went, oh, my God. I'm in that shirt and I fucking love that shirt. And then he goes, he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you remember that photo uh, because after it was taken, I cropped him out and I used it as my profile picture everywhere because my hair looked great. I was in that shirt. I was living my best life. And I, I cropped out that rando because <laughs> I barely knew him. And then, you know, like a year and a half later, we were dating and then, you know, uh, 17 years later, we're long since married so it's just so so weird but he loves to remind me that i cropped him out of that photo and i was like someday i will show that photo to the world and everyone's gonna go obviously she's gonna use that as a profile picture everyone's like my hair was in this beautiful layered thing it was almost glowing like i had a hemp necklace going on it was the early 2000s yeah. sleepy alone um and it just uh, it was banging oh yeah but where For that sure. shirt went, I don't know. I feel like it came into my life when I needed it. Mm -hmm. And then it just like dissolved on its own. Or maybe it magically appeared in some other girl's dresser because she needed it. <laughs> it's like the sisterhood of the traveling pants kind of You know thing. who's wearing it? Oh, that old shirt. crone in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> and I bet she looks amazing doing she it. She looks great. She yeah. looks great. Uh, what you drinking over there? Um, The last time we recorded, I was up till like 3 a.m. because I could not sleep because I had too much caffeine. So today I'm just doing a strawberry lemonade nice. in the hopes that it's going to go down nice and doesn't over caffeine me because apparently I offered to take a group of children swimming tomorrow and I need oh, to have wow. my wits about me. You do. And it's not even like I can just sit there and read while they're in the pool. I have to actually get in the pool which I don't want to do because that's closer to naked than I like. Yeah, I was just going to say. Yeah, it's not, I'm not a fan. Not a fan. But uh, I made a promise and I'd forgotten and they've reminded me. So it's just well, what listen, you do. You're a good, you're a good woman. You're a good woman. I'm a step away um, from a bathroom groan. Aren't we all? <laughs> In many ways, I think I am that groan now. Um <laughs> Listen, I've, I'm drinking a Matua. I'm drinking, I'm going back to one of my old friends, little white wine over here. 
uh, and just some water. But I cracked that bottle of wine when we got home last night. We went out to see a movie. We saw Deadpool and uh, Wolverine. Oh, how was it? It's so fun. I mean, look, it's, of course. you know, it's everything that you want it to be and the two of them. And it's, it's a delight. And I, there, I, I won't give any spoilers, but I will say I was going to text, text you last night. I, I do really feel like you need to see it sooner than later. I don't oh. want these spoilers ruined for you uh, if they haven't been already. Uh, but this is the headline news other than, yes, we enjoyed the movie. Um, there was a massive earthquake while we were in the movie. And I've been through many earthquakes in, in LA over the course of the last like decade that I've lived here. The craziest one, I looked outside and the water in my pool was like sloshing oh. out of the pool, going side to side. It was, nope. it was crazy. Um, but here's the thing in my experience, ex earthquakes usually last 10 to 20 seconds at most. They'll usually be an aftershock or two, you know, a couple minutes later, that's, that's smaller, whatever. Um, that's my personal experience throughout this time living here. Sure. When I tell you that that earthquake went on for in real time, well over a minute. In fact, there was a, a woman who worked there who stopped me, uh, because we, we had this moment where we were like, what do we do? Like, do we leave? Do we stay? Like, and I was like looking around and I'm like, well, there's nothing that can fall on us. And like the biggest thing in an earthquake is you need to be, they, cause they say to like go under a table or right. whatever. That's just because stuff could fall off the wall or, or furniture could fall on you and injure you. And I was like, I don't think there's anything in here that could fall in this movie theater. Um, and by the way, <laughs> If things are crumbling, I think we've got bigger problems. Like it's not gonna matter where you are if if like sure. the ground is swallowing people. Like then then you know that's a. I guess I have no more summers left at that point. Um, but here's the thing. So we so we we kind of like came out of the theater for a couple of minutes just to like get some air for a second and decide are we gonna leave or are we gonna stay. And a woman working did say she was like that felt like it was close to two minutes. And I was like it felt like that to me too. Like it was so long mm. that I was like this is this is troubling. Um, but what we've what I've realized is because other people I know who live in that area, they were like, oh, yeah, it was just kind of same old, same old. What I realized is we were at a movie theater that was on the top floor of a like five or six story kind of, I don't know, mm. building shopping center thing. And I think part of the reason it felt so intense was because I, I mean, I've never been up that high during an earthquake before. Oh, sure. I've only ever been on a ground floor. So I'm I'm wondering if it was the building because the buildings are also built for earthquakes, right? So they're built right. to move. That's part of the way they're built. They need to be able to kind of sway a little bit so that they don't crack and crumble and break. Um, long story short, too late. It turns out that it may have been multiple small earthquakes at the same, like, like back to back to back to back. So it wasn't necessarily, but then I'm like, that's kind of like a tree falling in the forest, right? Like, it's like, is it sure. one long one or is it nine small ones? Like, isn't it the same? Sure. Um, yeah, all of this to say, we got back home. Uh, we put on some episodes of Hot Ones, which I'm just such a fan of. And uh, I was sure. like, I'm going to have some wine just to like, just to chill out a little. So I was like, yeah. I got to finish up the bottle. That was a very uh, long way of telling you what I was drinking. No, oh, I I love when what you're drinking has a backstory. Yeah. I like that. Um, the idea of there being an earthquake while you're at a movie theater is horrifying to me. And I'm not diminishing your trauma, but the first thing that came to my head was, was it an earthquake? Or was it like a teaser trailer to San Andreas 2? Yeah. Well, that was this... the other thing. At first, at first, I couldn't tell that it was happening because I think we're watching like an action movie. So it's like, at first it didn't... Right. I think it felt like it was in my head, if that makes sense. Like, it was like, oh, we're not moving. I'm just moved. Like, I'm just into the movie. Sure. It's like those rides that you go on that bump you at the right yeah. time to make you feel like you're in the action. So you're like, oh, I'm just in it. Right. But then it just kept going. Oh. Yeah, it was It was a, It was was a. a lot. It was a lot. But listen, it wasn't nothing that a, that a little... A little Sauvignon Blanc and watching some celebrities eat hot wings that make them cry couldn't cure. You know what I mean? I, I got to yeah. tell you, I am such a fan of of that show. Uh, 
I we we had just watched obviously the Deadpool movie, and so seeing Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman on Hot Ones afterwards oh, was a delight. Sure. Was a delight. Sure. I love so many things about it. I think what I love about it is like he always the the host. I don't know who this guy is. Uh, the the whatever his name is, the host. He always has such great questions, and it's like literally sure. we're watching people be so disarmed, um, because they feel like they're dying. That, sure. you know, you get some great answers or at least some comedy. I, I don't know. Listen, I, I feel like you and I on that show would be a would be a hoot. Oh, I I wouldn't make it very far in. No, I, I'd give it all a go. I'd hate it, but I'd give it all a go. Uh, have you seen the Idris Elba one? Nope. I'm writing that down. I'm going to watch that later. <laughs> yeah, because there's a moment where it's like he gets to a level and he's like, "Who uh, whose idea was this? What's his name? <laughs> And then someone like off camera says something. He goes, was it you? <laughs> like he's, he's so intense. That's it's so uh, funny. it's good. Um, yeah. Look, I know that they're like looking for like Ryan Reynolds, Hugh Jackman level people, but if they ever just want like slightly lesser known chuckleheads. Yeah. We're interested. We're interested. We're interested. We're interested. It's, uh, I mean, I can't believe I'm saying that because I can't handle spicy at all. No, but me neither. For the bit, I'd do it for the bit. Yeah, we would do it for the bit for sure. Yeah, for sure. You know, and I think I also watched the Gordon Ramsay episode, which was incredible because he brought an entire bag of his own things to like combat the heat. At one point, he just chugs like almost an entire bottle of Pepto Bismol. Like, <laughs> it's, it's incredible. Oh, and listen. We would I, have to come with our own, right? Are you allowed to bring a sauce? Like, could I we bring know, our own sauces? I don't know if you can bring sauce. They they give you milk and water right. and ice. And sometimes they'll give you ice cream. What was amazing was Hugh Jackman starts eating. It's just vanilla ice cream. He starts eating it. And then he goes, there's chilies in here. That's the, that's the joke, right? It's it's spicy, too. And they're like, no, we we haven't done anything to the ice cream. <laughs> So it just mentally breaks everybody. Yeah. I'm sure there's somebody who's had it that's like, these are great. Maybe. Like, well, not I'm going to have to look that up. I'm going to have to look that up. I think there's probably a few, but the really hot ones towards the end, I think, challenge almost anybody. I have a feeling that I'd be like, oh, this one's bad. And they'd be like, that's that's actually a a, a joke one that didn't have any flavoring and i'd be like oh really <laughs> oh yeah yeah i'd be like oh this is spicy uh lauren that's just a plain baked potato <laughs> <laughs> oh god well listen um let's get into it mm. i am so excited about this episode because i know nothing about it and it's a cult episode and i felt like i feel like i know about all the cults but i think what we know is is that we can't possibly know about all so the cults many because there's so many cults um now, this, of course, was our June patrons poll pick over on patreon.com slash true crime and cocktails. Uh, we have a subscription based service where you can join. And then one of the benefits is you get to vote in a poll monthly that chooses one of the episodes we cover on this, the main feed of the show. So check that out over there if you're interested in more information about that. But in the meantime, we're talking the narco satanist, narco satanist. Yeah, I've just been saying narco satanist. It's got to be. I, I don't think anyone's going to push however you say it. Fantastic. No one's defending them. Fantastic. I hope. <laughs> I hope not also. The narco-Satanist cult. Uh, and to give you a little bit of background, I'm going to, and to give you some background, I'm going to give you some background now. Not even a full glass of wine. You're doing in March great. Thank you so much. In March 1989, a university junior named Mark Kilroy went missing during a spring break trip to Mexico. His body was found a month later, buried on a ranch 20 miles from where Mark was last seen. But investigators got more than they bargained for, because solving Mark's case led to the discovery of a cult known for making human sacrifices. So what actually happened to Mark Kilroy? How did this cult get started? And just how many more victims did investigators find? Christy Oxborough investigates. Now, I had not uh, heard about this group prior to choosing it. Uh, the yeah. people told me they wanted a cult. And I was like, all right, let's find one most people might not have heard of. I love that. So um, brace yourself. I, ah! I'm bracing. I'm bracing yeah. like I'm bracing for the hottest wing. 
Thank you so much. Oh, God. So, disclaimer right off the top. That's not the top, but we're calling it the top. Uh, this episode will contain mentions of suicide, animal death, and descriptions of gruesome violence. Mm. It's the easiest way I could say it. Uh, so, trigger warning for those who need it. Now, Mark James Kilroy was born March 5th, 1968, in Chicago, Illinois. In his childhood, his family moved to Santa Fe, Texas, a small town about 38 miles southeast of Houston. Mark was a devoted Catholic, often taking his Bible with him wherever he went. He was a member of the Boy Scouts of America, and he excelled in both sports and academics. He was an honor student who ranked 14th out of a graduating class of 210. After graduating in 1986, Mark attended Southwest Texas State University before transferring to Tarleton State University on a basketball scholarship. He then transferred to the University of Texas at Austin, where he studied pre-med. In March 1989, Mark finished his last midterm and prepped for spring break. Mark and his friend Bradley Moore drove to their hometown of Santa Fe, Texas, where they picked up their friends Bill Huddleston and Brent Martin. The four guys drove 380 miles south to South Padre Island, which is on the south coast of Texas. They arrived around midnight on March 11th. Mark called his parents to say that they had arrived safely. Uh, and this, just something worth noting, this was the second year in a row that the friends had taken this same trip over the course of spring break. So on Monday, March 13th, the four friends went to the beach, then attended a Miss Tanline contest. They parked their vehicle on the border of Brownsville, Texas, so that they could walk over the Gateway International Bridge, which is a 69 meter or 226 foot bridge, which links Brownsville with Matamoros, Mexico, uh, which was known for cheap bars and tourist trap shops. When they got to Mexico, the friends started at a bar called Los Sombreros before going to the London pub. Two very different vibes, uh, which I love. But during the course of spring break, the London pub changed its name to the Hard Rock Cafe. Oh. Just over the course of spring break. Um, Apparently, it's something they did every year because they thought it would entice more college kids. And I mean, who doesn't love a hard rock? Lord knows it played an integral part of our childhood so, it did. and our youth. So uh, I get it. I get it. We're also lured uh, by a hard rock. So Mark briefly talked to a woman that he had met earlier that day at that Miss Tanline contest. Uh, he then joined his friends for some dancing, and all four of them left the bar around 2 a.m. The four friends headed towards the bridge to walk back to their car, but about two blocks away, Mark stopped and said he needed a bathroom. The other three friends continued and waited for Mark at their car back in Brownsville, but when Mark didn't show up, they retraced their steps and went looking for Mark, but there was no sign of him. The friends went to the police in Texas to report Mark missing, but as we often hear on this show, the police initially thought that Mark would eventually sober up and return on his own. When Mark was still missing after 36 hours, his father, James, took the 380-mile trip to Brownsville and told the sheriff he would absolutely not be leaving until his son was found. James then spent hours passing out flyers on the International Bridge, hoping to find someone who had seen his son. It was said that James called his wife Helen every day and said, quote, good news, they didn't find a body. Oh, God. Which is heartbreaking. Uh, Helen eventually joined her husband in Brownsville, and they put up more than 20,000 flyers. The couple also offered a $5,000 reward, and the Brownsville business community chipped in 10000 uh, for the reward. Mark's case received a ton of news coverage. He made headlines across the country and was even featured on a segment on America's Most Wanted. 
but there was still no sign of Mark and police had absolutely no leads. Then on April 9th, 27 days after Mark's disappearance, Mexican police set up a roadblock in their efforts to cut down on drug smuggling across the border. One vehicle just drove straight through that roadblock without even stopping. Police pursued the vehicle, which led them to Rancho Santa Elena, about 20 miles outside of Matamoros. On the property, police discovered 65 pounds of marijuana and a pile of weapons. Oh. The property was owned by the Hernandez family, who were known in the area for their narcotics operation. Police arrested five members of the family, including Serafine Hernandez Garcia, who had who was the person who drove through the roadblock. Police also brought the ranch caretaker in for questioning. While at the police station, the caretaker noticed one of the missing posters featuring Mark Kilroy. The man pointed to the poster and told police that he had seen that kid. He said he'd actually given the kid bread and water because he found him tied up in the back of a truck on, a, on the property. But he said he didn't know what happened to the kid after that. Oh, my God. Then Seraphine was questioned about Mark Kilroy. And he admitted that Mark had been killed and was buried on that property. He even outright took police to the very spot and dug the remains up for them. The remains were officially identified through dental records as Mark Kilroy. Mark was just 21 oh. at the time of his death. And while police were incredibly shocked by this reveal, Seraphine told them, he didn't understand why they were making such a big deal over one man when there were several more buried on the property. <laughs> is he giving up this info? It's this is crazy. Wild. Uh, so Seraphine took the police around the horse corral at the ranch and showed them seven bodies that were buried in that area alone. Seraphine said he didn't kill anyone. He, he was just the one who buried them all. Wow. In total, investigators found 15 bodies on that property. Some were shot in the head. Others were killed with a sledgehammer or a machete. Uh, police believe that there are likely more bodies buried at other locations. And uh, many of those victims were just never identified. But also found on that property was a shack about 14 feet by 24. The concrete floor was covered in candles, cigars, tequila bottles, and chili peppers, and the walls were smeared with blood. Oh my God. There were four small pots around the room containing twigs, coins, human hair, parts of a rooster, and the head of a goat. There were two bloody wires with wrist-sized loops that hung from the ceiling. According to Seraphine, they would place a victim's wrists through the loops uh, and then allow the victim to just hang there so they could drain the blood from the person's body. The Jesus. casualness with which he speaks of it is quite alarming. Um, there was also an oil drum uh, in a corner that was used to boil victims. Uh, the police said the place smelled like death. Seraphine said, quote, this is where the spirits live. Oh, yeah. Great. Again, so casual. Like, it's just everybody knows that. Like, it. oh, boy. So if all that isn't horrifying enough, in the center of the shack, there was a cauldron or nganya, which is the central piece of the Paolo Mayambi religion. The belief is that the cauldron comes alive when an animal is sacrificed and the bones of the animal captures the spirit, which then enters the body of the person performing the ritual. Inside the inganya was a turtle, a horseshoe, human bones, goat hooves, and human blood. In the center of the pot was a mass that would turn out to be a human brain. 
Believing that this was all linked to Bruhaniha or witchcraft, the officers refused to go any further and called in reinforcements. The men arrested at the ranch were questioned about the contents of the shack, and they said their leader, who they called El Padrino, uh, or Godfather in Spanish, uh, would perform rituals that would protect the ranch and the people on it with a magic shield. They all believed so deeply in this magic that Seraphine admitted he only drove through the roadblock because he believed that El Padrino's magic had made them invisible to the police. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So who is El Padrino? I'm so glad you asked, but I'm also not. <laughs> mm. So, Adolfo de Jesus Constanzo was born November 1st, 1962 in Miami, Florida. His mother was a 15-year-old Cuban refugee who was also a devoted priestess of the Afro-Caribbean religion Santeria. Adolfo's mother moved them to San Juan, Puerto Rico when Adolfo was a baby. It was there he was baptized Catholic. However, when he was just six months old, his mother took him to a priest of Paolo Mayambi, which is a darker offshoot of Santeria. The basic idea of Paolo Mayambi is to harness dark energy to make yourself successful and even invincible. The priest told her that Adolfo, who again was six months old, he said he was the chosen one and was destined for greatness and power. It's a lot to put on a six-month-old baby. Yeah. In 1972, the family moved back to Miami, where Adolfo started an apprenticeship with a Haitian priest. As a child, Adolfo was known for leaving dead animals on the doorsteps of people he believed had wronged him. Uh, but, I mean, his mother did the same. She left headless chickens and goats on the doorsteps of any neighbors who called her a witch. It's not helping with your witch I was just going to say. Around the age of 10, Adolfo started performing rituals with his mother, uh, who was arrested roughly 30 times throughout her son's childhood. Uh, the charges ranged from vandalism to shoplifting, grand theft, child neglect, and even check fraud. Adolfo seemed to follow in his mother's footsteps, getting arrested for a variety of petty crimes throughout his teens. Then in 1976, Adolfo began predicting the future. Oh. In, in 1980, he claimed that then-President Ronald Reagan would survive an assassination attempt. And sure enough, months later, in March 1981, a lone gunman opened fire at the president. Reagan assassination attempt, side note. Ooh. Reagan was shot in March 1981 while walking to his limo following a speaking engagement at the Washington Hilton. Reagan suffered a broken rib, a punctured lung, and some internal bleeding. He was stabilized at the emergency room and eventually made a full recovery. Also injured during that shooting was a Secret Service agent, a police officer, and the White House press secretary. The shooter, 25-year-old John Hinckley Jr., said he only shot at Reagan to try and impress actress Jodie Foster. Right. Because Hinckley had developed an obsession with Jodie Foster after seeing her in the 1976 movie Taxi Driver. Hinckley was found not guilty by reason of insanity, and was remanded to a psychiatric facility. He was released 35 years later in 2016. Since then, uh, Hinckley has been releasing music on his YouTube channel and selling paintings he made of his cat on eBay. I haven't personally looked into either, but, you know, I just don't think I will. You know, you know what's really chilling is you were just talking about how he did it because he was so obsessed with Jodie Foster and my again my lightning speed ADHD brain was like you know people say I look like Jodie Foster should I be afraid of this man then I thought oh he's surely dead and then you chilled me to my core when you said not only is he still alive but he's out of I guess captivity because he was in a mental facility right yeah not um yeah. not prison I didn't know that you got out 
of the medical, uh. the mental uh, facility. I didn't know that, it, it, meaning if you had, you know, I guess he didn't succeed at the murder. So I guess maybe it's not right. a life thing at that point. Yeah. Uh, well, I I do believe the press secretary that was also injured in this did end up with some like horrific problems because of those injuries and then mm -hmm. died 30 years later because of it. Oh, interesting. So we can say he didn't kill anyone, but also kind of did. Gotcha. You know? Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, it's a, uh, it's a wild, yeah, I thought guilty by insanity meant that's what you're there for life. But yeah, I guess not. I guess not. I don't know. Ah, oh, shit. Someone in my home's made popcorn. Oh, that salty, buttery goodness kills me. Anyhow, some of us have to work back yep. to Adolfo Constanzo. So in 1981, he graduated from high school at the bottom of his class uh, before enrolling in junior college where he dropped out after a single semester. That same year, he was arrested twice for shoplifting. Once, he tried to shoplift a chainsaw. Jesus. Which be... feels... It's hard to do. Yeah. I'm just like, is that just proving how confident he was? I don't know. In 1983, Adolfo pledged himself, oh boy, to uh, Haiti and Pempe, which is basically the Paolo Mayumbi equivalent of the devil. Oh. Uh, during this devotion ceremony, Adolfo's priest mentor carved mystic symbols into Adolfo's flesh before Adolf Adolfo proclaimed, quote, my soul is dead. I have no God. Yeah. Okay. And in a move that absolutely none of us saw coming, Adolfo then went to Mexico City for a modeling job. Well, not in a million years. Yeah. Not in yeah. a million years. Was that what I thought you were going to say next? Yeah. It's a real twist of uh, just uh, this man's life. Um, while in Mexico City, he started recruiting the first disciples to his soon-to-be soon cult. These members included Jorge Montes, Omar Ocho, and Martin Quintana Rodriguez. Not much is known about Jorge, um, but Martin was said to be drawn to Odolfo for his psychic abilities. Uh, Martin and Odolfo became lovers. But since Adolfo was 21 and Martin was 15 at the time, uh. it's safe to say that that uh, Martin was likely groomed in that situation. Uh, when Omar was 15, a gypsy read his palm and told him one day he would meet a powerful man who would change his destiny. Three years later, Omar Omar saw Adolfo reading tarot cards on a street corner. Adolfo told him. Uh, that he was about to fulfill a prophecy from his youth and that a woman had told him to be ready for this moment. And that was enough to clinch it for Omar that he was going to be one of Adolfo's most dedicated followers uh, for life. Mm. In 1984, Adolfo outright moved to Mexico City where he started gaining more followers, <clears throat> including four police officers. Here we go. Adolfo introduced his followers to the tenets of his practice, which included rum, cigar smoke, candles, cauldrons, and the killing of animals, specifically like mostly roosters and goats. Adolfo told them that sacrifice was essential because taking a life brought vitality to your own life. I know. Uh, and for lack of better words, uh, his followers absolutely ate that shit up and felt that Adolfo could do no wrong. He made a name for himself as a tarot card reader with a reputation for performing ritual cleansings for healing and protection. But it wasn't long before the rituals escalated, and in 1985, Adolfo was having his followers rob graves so they could use human bones instead of animal bones in the cauldron or nganya. Uh-huh. And soon Adolfo wasn't satisfied enough with just the bones. He wanted a bigger sacrifice, which he believed would give more protection. 
And while the group started with chickens, then went to goats and cows, Adolfo finally decided, well, the only next logical step was outright human sacrifice. And it wasn't enough to just kill someone during the ritual. Adolfo would take parts from the victim's bodies and place them in the cauldron. Um, for example, when oh, if, if Adolfo would, would want strength, he would literally cut the muscles off a person and, and put them in the enganya. And of course, is... the person would be alive at the time it started. Dear so God. Yeah. Yeah. I hope people are listening earlier in the day. Um, and as disturbing as it is to think about, uh, the, mo the more successful Adolfo seemed, the more followers and clients he gained. His clients paid him as much as $8,000 a session for spells that could grant them protection, power, and good luck. These clients included wealthy, already powerful people, like, you know, crime bosses, movie stars, judges, magistrates, politicians, and even Florentino Ventura Gutierrez. Who's that? Oh, just the chief of Mexico's Interpol office. Oh, God. Yeah. In 1986, Florentino introduced Adolfo to the Calzada family, who were prominent in the drug trade. Adolfo was interested in getting involved because he said he wanted to profit off the foolishness of people who did drugs. In fact, Adolfo was so against drugs that he forbid any member of his cult from using them. And when follower Jorge Valente started using drugs, instead of simply kicking him out of the cult, Adolfo murdered Jorge as both a sacrifice and as a lesson to his other followers. Wowzer. Adolfo performed several rituals for the Calzadas, and they truly believed that Adolfo's magic was responsible for their increased profits and now thriving business. Their shipments seemed safer, and police no longer intervened in their business. The thing is, Adolfo was getting insider information from his police clients, which he used to then tell the drug cartel clients when and where they could be safely making shipments. But to the drug cartels, Adolfo was giving them mystical protection. And since the Calzada's business started booming after Adolfo got involved, Adolfo went to their leader, Guillermo, and demanded the cartel give him 50% of their business. Guillermo, of course, refused, so Adolfo had his people torture, mutilate, and murder Guillermo and six members of Guillermo's family. Jesus. Uh, when people searched the Calzada office, they found large amounts of blood and burned candles. They said it looked as though some sort of ritual had taken place. Within a week, police pulled seven bodies from the Sampango River. The bodies were so badly mutilated, only three could ever be identified. Wow. And when I say mutilated, I mean, you know, missing ears, fingers, toes, genitals, sometimes even a heart. Jesus. Uh, some were burned. Two of the bodies were missing brains. And uh, one um, had its spine uh, ripped out. Yeah. It's like he's playing Mortal Kombat. Jesus yeah. Christ. Yeah, it's, it's horrifying. Uh, and again, and just a reminder that it was a cop that put Adolfo in contact with these people. Uh, and if you're absolutely horrified by the thought of a member of law enforcement who worked at Interpol, um, being a devout follower of a man who believed in human sacrifices, um, just know that as a police officer, Florentino was known to personally torture prisoners. So he wasn't like a great dude to begin right. with. Um, so it also may not come as a surprise that Florentino's death was as dark as the rest of his life. In September 1987, Florentino fatally shot his wife, Maria, and then turned the weapon on himself. Maria was 37 at the time of her death. Florentino was 59. It is said that they were survived by a son. 
followers truly believed that Adolfo's spells were keeping them safe and even granting them invisibility from the police. So by 1987, Adolfo was making an incredible amount of money. He owned several high-end properties and a fleet of luxury vehicles, including a Mercedes-Benz worth 80 grand. Adolfo also brought in money through various scams, uh, like the time he posed as a DEA agent and stole a shipment of cocaine from a drug dealer in Guadalajara and then used his police followers to sell that shipment for a hundred grand. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, however, Adolfo didn't want the money. He just wanted the power. So his next move was to get involved with the Hernandez family, who ran one of the biggest drug operations in the area. But he had no connection to any Hernandez family member. So how was Adolfo going to get a meeting? Well, on July 30th, 1987, Adolfo used his Mercedes to cut off a green Impala in traffic. The Impala was being driven by Sarah Aldretti, who was an honors student at Texas Southmost College Community College in Brownsville. More about Sarah. Uh, she was born in 1964 in Matamoros. She attended high school and college across the border in Brownsville. In October 1983, Sarah married a man named Miguel Zacharias. Uh, Sarah was 21. Miguel was 32. Things quickly went downhill. They separated five months later. Sarah was attractive, popular. She got good grades. She was a physical education major who organized a booster club for the school's soccer team. She was attending school and working two part-time jobs when she met Adolfo. And while Adolfo cutting her off in traffic may seem like an innocent accident, the truth is the entire thing was staged because Adolfo wanted to talk to Sarah. Why? Because at the time, Sarah's boyfriend, Gilberto Sosa, was a mid-level drug dealer with the Hernandez family. Within a few weeks, Adolfo got his introduction to the Hernandez drug operation. He told them he could use Paolo Mayambi rituals to bring them more money and security from the police. The Hernandez family agreed, and when their business skyrocketed, Adolfo approached them and asked for 50% of the business because he felt responsible for their success. And unlike the Calzada family, the Hernandez cartel said yes. Wow. Yeah, 50% feels like you're coming in hot. But they were just like, yeah, great, whatever you want. At their peak, Adolfo said that the cartel was importing about a thousand pounds of marijuana to the U.S. every week. And with things going so well, Adolfo decided to increase the number of rituals he performed. He moved his cult to Rancho Santa Elena, about 20 miles outside of Matamoros. You know, because he wanted more space for sacrificing. Uh, and honestly, the details just get viler uh, from here. And I know you're probably thinking, Christy, you've mentioned removing hearts and spines. How could it get any worse? And maybe worse isn't the right word, just like vile in a different way, uh, in a more disturbing way. I don't mm. know. It's all disturbing. Um, something that really stuck with me, uh, apparently during a sacrifice, there was a specific victim who refused to scream while he was being tortured. Uh, Adolfo claimed that the man's silence denied him the power of owning that man's soul. So he told his followers to go out and get him someone who would scream. Jesus. And that statement is going to haunt my dreams for life, I think. I I don't really know what to do with it. Um, yeah. But uh, their sacrifices continued to increase. They killed dealers from rival drug operations uh, various people without housing, sex workers, runaways, Sarah's ex-boyfriend, Gilberto. Uh, and then they also killed a man who afterwards they found out was actually a cousin of one of Adolfo's followers. And yet, when Adolfo admitted, oh shit, we killed your cousin? Sorry, dude. 
no one seemed to mind. That's wild. Yeah, um. Oh, also, if you think being in the cult made you safe, it didn't, because sometimes Adolfo would just randomly select one of his own to be sacrificed. Wow. And somehow they also were just like, understood they they were like we get it because they believed their deaths would protect the rest of the group with a magic shield wow yeah yeah oh and soon after getting in with the hernandez drug operation adolfo became romantically involved with sarah who came to be known as the cults la madrina or godmother uh she was also just simply called their witch which is an interesting choice yeah. Um, on their behalf, not hers. Uh, and not only did Adolfo use Sarah to get an in with the Hernandez cartel, he also used her to make their abductions easier because he felt a woman would be able to lure men in easier than a man would. And so that's exactly what Sarah did. She would lure men in so that people like Seraphine could abduct them, take them to the ranch, do unspeakable things to them, and then just bury them on the property so no one would know. And who knows how long this operation would have gone on for if it wasn't for Mark Kilroy. Two days before Mark's abduction, Adolfo said he needed a brain for the Enganya so it could make the spirits smarter. Adolfo then specifically told his followers to go get him a spring breaker. So on the night of March 13th, Seraphine and another cult member drove around Matamoros searching for an American male when they came across Mark Kilroy. At first, they offered him a ride, and Mark said, yes, please, because he, he admitted he'd had too much to drink and he didn't want to walk. But when a second vehicle suddenly pulled up, Mark panicked, started to run. The man got out of the car, yelled, freeze, told Mark he was under arrest, handcuffed him, and forced him into one of the vehicles. To be clear, they were not police. They were just taking advantage of a kid who was far from home, inebriated, and scared. Oh, it's terrifying. They wrapped duct tape around Mark's eyes and mouth before leaving him in the back of their truck for hours. At some point, the caretaker found him, gave him food and water, then put the duct tape back over Mark's mouth and just walked away. Yeah. About 12 hours after being taken, Mark tried to escape, but he was quickly captured and taken to the horrific shack where they performed rituals. Adolfo then offered prayers to the gods before taking a gulp of rum from a bottle and then spitting the rum onto Mark and then into the Enganya. Adolfo then hit Mark in the head with a machete, which was dull, so he had to do it repeatedly for it to work. A seraphine said it sounded like a coconut being smashed. Oh my god. Adolfo then removed Mark's brain from his body and placed it in the Enganya. Seraphine then buried Mark's body in the horse corral. He claims that when Mark was buried, uh, they attached a metal wire to Mark's spine so that once the body was decomposed enough, they could just go over to the wire that was sticking out of the ground and yank it out to remove Mark's spine. Why? Uh, because they wanted to turn the bones into necklaces for the cult members. Oh my God. Sarah already wore a necklace made from the bones of various victims. When police raided the compound in April 1989, they found blood spatter on the walls of the house, as well as pictures and clothing belonging to young children. Police were never able to determine the identity of those children, so it is unsure whether they were victims or not. Mm. But also in the house was a stack of pornography and a hidden torture chamber. There were no further details about that, and to that I say thank God. Yeah, I, I probably would have spared you all those details, but I would like to spare myself. So pretty jazzed that there was nothing further. Um, and while some of the cult members were immediately arrested, 
five of them were in the wind, including Adolfo Constanzo, Sarah Aldretti, Omar Ocho, Martin Quintana Rodriguez, and a 22-year-old named Alvaro de Leon Valdez, who the group called El Duby. And look, I'm not one of them, so I'm going to call him Alvaro uh, because I just feel like an idiot saying Duby out loud, if I'm being really honest. Of course. So apparently once the bodies were found, Adolfo and his and four of his followers hid at a Holiday Inn in Brownsville. By the time police found their location, they had fled. Police searched every current and former address for Adolfo, but had no luck finding the cult members. Apparently, Adolfo and Sarah used fake names to fly to Mexico City, where they hid in a fourth-floor apartment in the heart of the... Ooh, Cuauhtémoc neighborhood. Wowza. But the police ran out of leads and had no way of finding the missing cult members. And then someone got the idea that if they performed some sort of exorcism on the shack where Adolfo performed his rituals, well, then Adolfo might lose his power. And I don't think they truly believed that, but they believed if they filmed the exorcism and put it on TV, that Adolfo might see it and get angry and end up coming out of hiding. And while that seems wildly far-fetched, remember at this point, they had nothing to go on, so this was a full Hail Mary kind of a move. So the police bring in a witch doctor to Rancho Santa Elena. He performs an exor exorcism he pours gasoline inside the shack and on top of the engaña, which they had pulled out to the front door so you could see it from afar. The entire shack burned to the ground. The police invited a news crew to film the entire thing and broadcast it live on TV. And somehow, their plan actually worked. That's wild. Adolfo saw the broadcast and his followers said at the sight of the engaña burning, Adolfo just went berserk. He started screaming that their protection was now gone, so nothing mattered anymore. He then put a pile of cash on the stove in the apartment and just started burning it. Days later, on May 6th, police received reports of a woman matching Sarah's description visiting a grocery store in the Cuauhtémoc neighborhood plainclothes police officers were sent to the area to do a quiet search. And unbeknownst to them, Adolfo was in the apartment across the street watching when one officer unknowingly started looking at the car that belonged to the cult. Adolfo started screaming to the followers that they'd been found. He then grabbed an Uzi submachine gun and just started firing at the police. If he'd done nothing, they probably would have never found him. But at this point, the right. Engaña was burned, his protection was gone, he was as good as found. Gunfire between the cult members and the police continued for nearly an hour, but Adolfo knew there was no escape for them. So he told his followers, if they died now, willingly, they would later be reborn. None of them were interested in that. But Adolfo... <laughs> took Martin and Alvaro to the back bedroom. He handed Alvaro a machine gun and told him, kill me and Martin. Alvaro refused, so Adolfo slapped him in the face twice. Adolfo then said he'd purposely make Alvaro's life in hell miserable if he didn't do what he asked. And to that I say, is he going to hell or is he going to be reborn? Make up your mind. Great question. Adolfo and Martin held each other as Elvero shot them both. Wow. Martin was just 21 at the time of his death. Adolfo was 26. Once Adolfo was dead, Sarah ran from the apartment and shouted to the police to cease fire. She said, quote, I've escaped 
Thank God I'm saved. I've been through hell since they kidnapped me. I thought I'd never get away. I'm so glad you came. She said it was hell. She said she was treated like a prisoner. Police were skeptical that she's now saying she was just a victim in this whole thing. Right. Um, I mean, she claimed she was really saddened by what happened to Mark Kilroy, saying, you know what? I even helped hand out flyers when he went missing. And for those who may say, okay, well, maybe Sarah was innocent this whole time. From the sounds of it, she wasn't. According to multiple cult members who were interviewed separately, uh, Sarah was in the room at the time of Mark's death. So if Sarah knew that Mark was dead, why would she volunteer to help hand out flyers unless she's simply trying to look innocent? Right. So was Sarah a willing participant or was she really abducted and potentially brainwashed? She seemed to believe in the religion that they were spouting. Uh, when she was interviewed from prison, she told reporters, quote, I don't think the religion will end with us because it has a lot of people in it. They found a temple in Monterey that isn't even related to us. It will continue. That doesn't really sound like... Doesn't sound like she was super anti. Correct. Correct. Uh, Sarah also did lure her ex-boyfriend to the ranch so they could use him as a sacrifice. And yet, the only death she seemed saddened by was Mark Kilroy. And I don't know if there it's because it, in a twisted way, he was the reason they got caught. Right. I don't know. Interesting. Also, she willingly wore a necklace made of bones. Well, there is that. Human bones. So, something to keep in mind. Fourteen cult members were indicted on various charges, including conspiracy, obstruction of justice, weapons and narcotic violations, and, of course, murder. Serafine Hernandez Garcia was sentenced to 67 years, but for cooperating with the police in 1998, his sentence was reduced to 50 years. Adolfo's first followers, Jorge Mon Montez and Omar Ocho, were both convicted of murder. Jorge was sentenced to 35 years. Omar died in prison from a heart attack before he could be sentenced. Mm. Alvaro Dileon Valdez was convicted on the mur of the murders of Odo Odofo and Martin. He was sentenced to 30 years. I find it interesting that he killed the two people. Outright admitted, yes, I shot them because they told me to, but I did it. And he got 30 years. And other guys who didn't even admit to it killed one person and got 35 yeah, that's interesting. It just feels almost like they were like, no, they were bad guys anyway. It feels like you know? that, doesn't like it? That's, you know, just feels not balanced, but neither here nor there. Sarah Aldretti was sentenced to six years for criminal association in 1994 after a very long, drawn-out trial. She was convicted on multiple charges of murder and given an additional 60 years. Ooh. The cult, uh, which didn't appear to give themselves a specific name, is often referred to as the Narco-Satanists. And while the group admitted to 14 murders in the span of just nine months, investigators believe that between 1987 and 1989, the group was responsible for 74 unsolved murders, 14 of which involved children. Unfortunately, investigators lacked enough evidence to press any charges. Mark Kilroy's parents, uh, James and Helen, believed that their son's death happened for a reason, saying that if it wasn't for Mark, the other bodies never would have been found and the cult would have continued to kill for who knows how long. James and Helen have since created an anti-drug foundation in their son's name. As of this record, and this is a chilling thing to say out loud, two cult, rem two cult members remain at large my god reporting for this absolute horror show of an episode i'm christy oxborough 
Wowzer. Well, listen, let's take a quick break, hit the can, grab a drink, and we're going to be back to talk about our thoughts on the narco-Satanist cult on this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. One, two, three. Welcome back to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're, of course, discussing the narco-Satanist cult. Ah, what a what a <laughs> wild ride. What a dark, wild mm-hmm. ride. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, so much of this is so fascinating. Um, the moment for me, first of all, that I can't really wrap my head around is Seraphine just giving up all of this information. Yeah. I don't fully understand why it was like, well, here's everything. Like, like what happened for him? Like, was yeah. there, you know, was there something that he was, or did he, was he just like, well, the jig is up. I mean, the fact that he was like, I didn't kill any of these people. I just buried them. I mean, I feel like he was probably complicit. Feels like he's. Oh, a hundred percent. If he was willingly helping to abduct people that he knew were about to die. Yeah. I mean. That's not you're a an great accessory. Look. Yeah. I just assume, and I could be way off, but it feels like did he genuinely, genuinely think that these rituals were protecting them? Because he thought they were invisible to police. So did he think he's like, Yeah, here's all the bodies. Who cares? You're not gonna do anything. We're protected. And I... that's like, ah, so you are gonna do something. That's very smart because, yeah, the fact that he said, oh, the only reason I drove through that roadblock was because I believed that the magic made me invisible to the police. That I was like, if you believe that, that, that whatever fully, um, yeah, yeah, that's a great point that he probably thought I can tell them anything and they won't do anything because we're protected, which is, again, chilling. Yeah. And it's also the joke that if he had stopped... And then they just talk to him and let him go. Yeah. Like he led them right there. Yeah. So it's like, it's the only thing I can think of is he truly believed that he was invincible. It must be. Something because he was like, yeah, they can't see me. They don't care. And it's like, you, you blew the whole thing, which is great because it needed to be stopped. But like, oh yeah, yeah he, don't get me wrong. gave them everything easily. I'm I'm very glad that he did, but yeah, to your point, it's like, yeah, it's just it's just it's wild. Um, the fact that he that Aldolfo started doing basically spell work with his mom at age ten, it's like he was like weirdly born into this world, which feels mm. interesting. Um, now I have to go on a quick a quick uh, side note tangent, which is obviously on the break I had to look up. John Hinckley Jr.'s art. Um, of course. I don't know if you've looked at any of this. I have not. But uh, this was one that was sp- pretty chilling to me. So not his cat. There is ones of his cat also. Okay. But this one is a, I, I am interpreting as a woman with green hair and there's kind of like two red balls where maybe her are supposed to be her boobs. I don't know. But here's... Here's the bigger thing for me. Mm-hmm. He's got 2,700-ish followers. Sure. And the comments are like, we love you. Um, And then he's saying, what would you like for me to sell at the merch table of my upcoming shows? People are like, shirts with your paintings and your name on them. Or the original paintings, a matchbook, uh, sweatshirts. I, I'm just, I, I, I'm, I'm less shocked by the art (laughs) and I'm more curious about, about, um, this following that he has, which is Hmm. interesting. He's also calling it a redemption tour. I believe the music tour he's doing. Um, yeah, I mean, anyway, I, I just, that really stuck out to me as, uh, he must have been really young when he did that crime. I think he was in his 20s. Because he doesn't look... I mean, I guess that was, what, 30 years ago? 40? I don't know. When did I even say? Oh, 81. 
81. It was 42 years ago. Right. Okay. So he could be 43. in his 60s. He could be in his 60s. Okay. Anyway, just had to take you on that tangent. And in case you were wondering, um, yeah, there's one of his cats. Okay. Yeah. It's just, I'm not saying people don't deserve another chance. Sure. But it this just feels like the level of violence and what you you put the families through especially i believe the press secretary family is horrifying and now you're just out there making art well i think the thing that's interesting to me is the want to be in the public mm. and that he's got an audience Oh, Which I'm listen, shocked by the audience. Listen, I mean, we all know that, like, look, there's there's people who follow serial killers and and are fascinated by them and et cetera. Not that I, I'm not saying he's a serial killer. He's not um, the, that we know of. I'm not, no, he's not. We 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 know this. We're sure I, I shouldn't be misspeaking. Um, yeah, it's just interesting. Mm. It's interesting. It's interesting to me because, again, my assumption would have been, oh, this man did this crime 40 years ago. He must have passed on by now. Uh, not the case. No, not the case. Alive and uh, seemingly well. Yeah. 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 Um, anyway, just I had to give that a uh, little side because that's, of course, uh, the things that fascinate me on this show. Um, OK, so Adolfo, you know, the whole kind of like recruiting for the cult, you know, getting into the cult, the modeling gig. um. The fact that it was like, oh, these animal bones aren't enough. Go rob some graves. Get us, give us some human bones to work with. Then, of course, the next logical step being human sacrifice. I, it's interesting to me how quickly this feels like this kind of caught on, and it's interesting to me. I mean, again, I I enjoy that he asked this first cartel for fifty percent of their profits. They said no. He was like, okay, hold my beer. I'm going to now murder um, you all murder yeah. you all in a and your family some of your family members um but then the next one went for it yeah which is interesting so again i guess he his business plan i guess was not as crazy as we may have thought because the next one went for it um it, it's just interesting to me that i guess people really wanted the protection i guess that's really what it what it comes down to and, and this kind of like quote spiritual protection or oh. supernatural protection, et cetera, I guess had real value to these people, which is interesting to me. Now I got to call it out. Um, It's interesting to me that they started by just doing animal sacrifice. Then it's the grave robbing. Then they need human victims. Yeah. And they started the people from the, you know, the cartels, Sex workers, you mentioned uh, unhoused people. It's the same. What, what's fascinating to me, because again, we've done this show long enough. It's the same thing that happens with so many serial killers, where it's like if they had stuck to that and none of those people deserve to die, all of it is horrific and tragic, all of the above. Make no mistake, I'm not suggesting. But you and I both know it's going to take a lot longer. For these people to get caught if they're targeting people that aren't going to be as readily looked for. When you're starting to target spring breakers. Yeah. Right. That it, it's again, we see this, it, this. It's just what fascinates me in general in in life is patterns. I think patterns are really fascinating, both in the micro and in the macro. And the patterns that we see with so many serial killers is that when they deviate, when they they deviate from their M.O., when they start to target, you know, start to escalate into things that are more risky or, you know, targeting a new kind of victim, it always falls apart. And again, thank yeah. God it did. I'm glad it did. It's just interesting to me. You know? Yeah. Oh, it's, I don't even know why he specifically wanted the change. Right. But, right. I mean, it's also like, how sad is it that they were able to go for as long as they did? And right. It didn't stop until they took a white kid. 
Right. Essentially. So of everybody course. else, it was like, well, oh, it's fine. And like the idea of the children they potentially killed. Well, that was going to be the next thing I said. Now, I pray that none, no children were killed. Of, of course. Of course. Without saying. Do I think it's likely? Yeah. I think it's probably oh, yeah. likely. I mean, when you're thinking about this through the mindset of him, where it's like he's being very literal. I need to have more smarts. I need a brain. I need to have more, yeah. more strength. Get me muscles. There's obviously a world in which vitality, youth, all of these kinds of yeah. things. I don't want to think about it or belabor it. So nope. I'm going to move along quickly. But I, when you said that they had found children's clothing, I was like, oh my God. Like it, it just feels, it just feels like signs point, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, I also want to know, like, where did you get the kids? Do the kids not have families that were looking for them? I just, again, I mean, none of their victims deserved uh, what course. happened to them. Uh, but, yeah, it's just shocking that so many victims were killed. And it wasn't until all of a sudden an American was taken. And then it was like, oh, okay, now there's pushback. And well, then, what's interesting yeah. with that also is it also feels like there's a world in which they wouldn't have gotten caught because yeah. it was their own folly. It was um, Seraphine's own folly of believing that he was actually invisible. Um, yeah. Right. Because to that point, I mean, if if Mark's family is putting up 20,000 flyers and still nothing like these guys are also protected by cartels. Like not only like, yes, he's, yeah. he's providing the spiritual protection, but they're also, we also know that there was cops in the midst. There were. So, so to me, it's like, yes, of course, as the story always goes, as soon as it's like, you know, um, a white person, then people are listening and care. The only thing I would, I would say that, that I'm curious if it, he would have been found had it not been for this misstep. I'm curious how, what would have led and like it, there's no sign of him. He was taken in the night. Yeah. So how would they even get to there's a satanic cult harvesting and killing people? Like there's so many steps that I feel like would have to have been taken. And isn't it also interesting um if, you know, for them, their real true belief that they're, they're killing these people to get this psychic protection. And it's so blunt. It was such a blunder. Like it was such, yep. you know, there's there's definitive proof here that if you believe in energies or spirits or however you want to li label them. Someone's working against you if we're talking in their own terms. Right. Like it's like sure. it didn't work. If anything, yeah. you were attracting so much negative energy, if we're, ta again, talking in those terms, that it's like, this is what happened. But I don't know. Like, again, I'm I'm so glad that they were stopped. Obviously, it's, it's tragic that it took that long. And there was other, and Lord knows how many other people were killed that just have never been recovered. Um, oh, yeah, because they were only at that property for so long that it's yeah. like, who knows how long they were killing people at other properties. Exactly. But again, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Would they have eventually found him? If we know that they have the pol they have the police, they have government officials, they have the cartel all on their side. I don't know if he ever would have been found. I don't know. Oh, I absolutely think that if it hadn't been for that roadblock incident. Yeah. They never would have been. They, they'd still be doing stuff. They never would have been caught. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think they would have continued killing people, continued burying. We'd still have no clue. Mark's case would be like an unsolved. He just went missing. There's been right. no sign of him and that would be it. And I mean, kudos yeah. to his parents for taking oh. this and trying to turn yes. it into something positive and being like, well, if it wasn't for Mark, they wouldn't have got caught. And it's it's true. Yeah. Yes, 100%. If it wasn't for him, they wouldn't have gotten caught. All of that is true. Um, and yeah, of course, I'm, yes, I, I, God bless that that has given them any sort of modicum, tiny ounce of relief in the biggest nightmare of their lives. Um, okay. 
so many things. The fact that this police idea where it's like, if we televise us destroying his shit, mm -hmm. he will reveal himself. And they and it worked. Yeah. What's interesting about that to me, too, is, OK, so if and I'm just trying to wrap my head around what he claims to have believed. So if we believe that the cauldron is the pinnacle of all of this and yeah. the power and whatever. And and he believes if the cauldron is destroyed, then all of the protection, everything is destroyed. What's yeah. interesting to me is that then he would go ham. You would think my brain would, would go, it's all over. We're fucked. We have to go underground. Like we have to completely disappear. Yeah. So it's interesting that that wasn't the case. And then it turned into like a gunfight with the cops and him being like, yeah. someone has to kill me. Like, it's just an interesting... It's interesting to me that the police predicted correctly when, to me, it makes absolutely no sense logically. Oh, yeah. It's shocking to me that in his brain, he's like, okay, there goes our protection. To me, the next logical step is, so we go deeper hidden. Right. We don't have that protection. But to him, he was like, well, without it, it's nothing. Right. Now nothing matters anymore. I'm also wildly fascinated. Um like, I know he was bisexual. He had relationships uh, right. multi with multiple genders. But I'm fascinated because he had that relationship with Martin. And then he had a relationship with Sarah. And in the end, it was Martin that he wanted to die with. Yeah. It I was, was like, thinking about that, too. Leave her in another room. We'll be back. Take him. And then it was like, me and him. We're going to die holding each other. Right. So it's fascinating. It's like, then why did you even start a relationship with Sarah to begin with? You already got your in. She got you into the cartel. So then what was the point? Oh, I thumbs up. And then the video thumbs up again. I it's don't know. so chilling. I don't <laughs> like it when we're talking about these specific topics either. Um, yeah. yeah, that's a great point. I mean, is there a world in which she was kidnapped or felt like she had to go along with what they were saying because she feared for her life. I mean, yeah. I mean, I feel like that is possible. Um, she was, of course, sentenced to 66 years, 60 of which were for, for murder. So I don't know yeah. whether that was true or false. It's interesting if it was like a Stockholm syndrome thing or if she was just genuinely invested. I feel like that's one of those things where it's like, will we ever know the truth? I don't, I don't know that we'll mm -hmm. ever know what the truth is for her really. I mean, um, because obviously she's going to have to say that she was a victim, of course, when right when, after he's killed. She, of course she has to. Um, and again, that doesn't mean that she wasn't necessarily a victim, but it also doesn't necessarily mean that she wasn't. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, everything that I'm like, well, to me, that proves that she went along with it willingly. Everything could be said like she just did it so that she wouldn't be harmed in any way right but then i'm also like well if if she was spotted going to a grocery store on her own how many other opportunities was she given to leave the group yes and if there's if it, if it was true stockholm syndrome she would come back true and so I'm again, just, hmm. it's it's hard to know, right? Like, but that's what's interesting about this is what's interesting about cults to me in general. Um, but then also this added, you know, th this one is 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 also fascinating because so many cults, it's it's about like controlling your finances, controlling your life, sure, um, cutting you off from other people, et cetera. This one feels like it's just straight up killing, straight up killing and torturing. Yeah. Like, it's it's interesting because it's such an extreme, which is the only reason why I was like, if, again, we're just, I'm just, you know, writing a story here, but like, if sure. it was one of those things where she kind of got pulled in there and then sees this, and then anyone that tries to leave or whatever, she sees the same thing happen to them, I could buy that it was like, well, I had to fake it. I had to go along with it. Um, I don't sure. know. I don't know. Yeah. I just, you know, again, I always err on the side of wanting to believe women, of course. Um, of course. But, but I, I, but, the, but again, this one's so confounding because it's like, I don't know. What does that look like? And then I, I, it's also curious too, because it's like, 
what did she, how did she approach that court case, right? Was she approaching it that it was like, I'm completely innocent or did she admit to culpability, you know, like, yeah, who knows? It seems like the only time she tried to claim that she'd been kidnapped was when they first, like when he was dead and they first saw the police. Interesting. It seems like after that, she was just like, yeah, it was what it was. Yeah. And, and I guess her statements kind of to her statements to about like, well, the religion's going to continue. Yeah. And it's like, let's 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 hope that one doesn't. Well, yeah. I also I don't know if I can call this a religion. Personally, this feels like it's just uh, if the religion is murder, then I guess. Um, yeah. Well, even the religion, I mean, murder of animals, the religion was specifically like animal sacrifices. It was yeah. him that chose to bump that up to human. Uh, not any better. I mean, it's all no. grim. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then the last point that I, I had to touch on very quickly because it was kind of making me laugh. Uh, at, towards the end, when uh, Aldolfo was like, you know, telling the people that he had been on the run with, like, hey, if you die willingly now, you'll be reborn. And they were all mm -hmm. like, nah. Yeah. <laughs> I just love, oh, yeah. it's just, it's rare because typically, again, when we, we talk about cults, it's like, we know we've talked about so many different cults where it's like, people will follow the person to the end. They'll do yeah. anything. They'll take their own lives. Um, I like that these people, like once the jig was up, like once the police got involved or whatever, they were like, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm probably not going to kill myself though. Like I'm good on that. Oh uh, yeah. It was, I don't uh, want to be reborn. I'm not buying that. I'm yeah, yeah. Yeah. I enjoy that, that all of them were like, no. I'm I'm cool. I'm yeah. cool on that. Oh yeah. I uh, I think at that point that they were just like this is it. Like this is the end. We're never yeah. getting out of here because somebody ran through a roadblock and now you're firing a weapon when they weren't they were just looking in the window of the car. They weren't doing anything. They weren't like thinking this is something they were looking in the window of every car. It was once they got to the car they were using that Adolfo was just like, here we go. Take them out. And it's like, if you just sat there quietly and done nothing, they weren't even going to houses. They weren't checking apartments. They weren't knocking on doors. They were just currently, I mean, maybe it would have escalated to that, but they were just like looking at cars. And then it was like, I don't like the looks of it. So at that point, he'd just gotten so paranoid that that was it, I guess. Right. And that's all it took was get rid of the cauldron. And then it was like, well, nothing matters now. What's interesting about that, too, from like a psychology, you know, psychologist hat perspective is he was told as an infant that he was the chosen one or his mother was told. So he was yeah. he lived his whole life believing that he was the chosen one. He started yeah. predicting things that then, you know, we know at least one of them came true. So it's interesting to me that in his own delusion, he believed his own delusion so much that he didn't believe that he was all powerful unless he had that cauldron. Whereas, yeah. again, a lot of the times when we talk about cult leaders or, you know, um, even just, you know, when you hear about the like really crooked people that are running mega churches, like you'll hear the stories of, mm. I can't think of the names off the top of my head, but you know, the ones that are like bilking people out of, you know, hundreds of thousands yeah. of dollars, they really seem to believe that they are all powerful or, or, you know, some closeness to God, maybe some of the scammers don't, but I guess my perception of this person would be that they actually, that he would actually believe that he has these powers, that he can see the future, that he's the chosen one, that he's all these things. So what's interesting to me again, in building any kind of profile is the concept that he would be like, oh, it's all over, blow it up. There's nothing now. I have nothing. I'm not powerful. I I have no protection, et cetera. Like, it's interesting that he didn't then pivot and go, I'm the chosen one, guys. We got nothing to worry about. We just got to lay low. Yeah. You know? There wasn't even like a, we'll get another cauldron. <laughs> it was right. like, without right. that, that's it. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's it's wild. And maybe to your point, like, his whole life, he'd been told, like, 
you're this powerful person, you're destined for this, whatever. Maybe he just got to the point where he was like, I'm tired. It hasn't worked out yeah. like I thought it was going to. Or he put so much faith in that cauldron that the second it was destroyed, he was like, well, that's it. Like, did he yeah. really think they would just hide for a while and then double back? Like, I just can't believe he didn't go somewhere else and get another cauldron and start performing rituals somewhere else with his small following that he, of course, would increase to a bigger one. Right. So I don't get it. Um, but speaking of psychologist hat Please. situations, in uh, December of 2021, so not too long ago, um, a 15-year-old girl in Mexico had a photo shoot for her quinceanera, and she chose one of the houses that this cult had lived in as the backdrop. And, like, it has long been since abandoned, so it's this, like, graffitied, like, badass-looking thing, but specifically, like, everybody knows, especially in that area, they know that they see that house and go, oh, that's the house where the cult lived and murdered all those people. And, like, her dress, which stunning, full black. And so I'm like, okay. So my question is, did she choose that thinking it looks edgy and cool and that's why she went with it? Or is there, like, a darker, like, did she know anything about what happened there or was she just like doesn't matter it just looks cool or would she have specifically chosen it because a cult was there and she thought that would add a coolness or make her seem more adult or something i mean john hinckley jr's got followers on instagram telling them that they love him so it wouldn't surprise yeah. me if she was a cult enthusiast maybe oh and it's i mean so many of the comments on these photos, because whoever uh, took the photos posted them on like Instagram and so many comments are just like, what a beautiful shot. There's like a handful of people who are like, this is weird. You shouldn't use a place where people died like violent deaths as like a backdrop for your photo shoot for your birthday. Yeah. But it's just such a weird, I just can't decide if if I think she knew anything about that location before she chose it, or if she knew enough and was just like, this is going to make me look badass. Yeah. Like some question. sort of mob boss kind of cookies photo shoot. You know what I mean? Right, <laughs> right, right. Because yeah. would cookies take a full photo shoot? fully clothed obviously of course um in front of like a place where she does business maybe yeah it just felt like such a weird choice to me yeah well i, I mean uh, people I don't are get it people are weird people are weird great call um the last comment i just had to make very quickly is i think that we also just have to mention like there this was a period of time when like satanic panic was such a huge thing, right? Oh, like sure. there was so much in the late eighties and into nineties about like human sacrifice. And there's, there's so many fascinating documentaries and stories that you can watch and podcasts you can listen to about that, that topic. Um, but this, I think for me anyway, is the first one that it was like, Oh no, this is a, this is a satanic cult who was sacrificing humans. Yeah. And it's it's oh, fascinating yeah. because so many stories basically got made up out of thin air during this time where people were terrified that children were going to get kidnapped and sacrificed and all of these things in, in the United States and in Canada. Yeah. Um, I can't speak for other places. I'm just listing the ones that I had heard in this uh, one podcast I was listening to about this. Um, so what's interesting to me is that it's like this would have been a source for them to say, see, it's happened in Mexico. But I feel like no yeah. one was even doing that. It's just interesting to me that this whole thing, it feels like it was it was the thing that everyone was so afraid of at the time yeah. that wasn't really happening for the most part. 
But I guess what I've learned tonight is, but it was happening in some places, which is yeah. chilling. It was just never used, to your point, as uh, as an example. As proof. Yeah. Yeah. Because I don't think people knew it was happening until after it happened. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Horrifying. Listen, Christy Oxborough, fantastic work as always. This was a, a deep, dark chasm of death. And uh, you navigated us like a light in the darkness. We thank you now and always. <laughs> oh, I I mean, it's it's a pleasure, but also like... I'm excited to just like bloop, yeah, erase that out, shake my etch a sketch brain, and uh, get it get it gone. Hundred percent, hundred percent. We thank you, dear listeners, for joining us on this dark path. If you haven't already, give us a follow on the socials on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at True Crime and Cocktails on Twitter at Not Detectives. If you'd like some bonus content, go over to patreoncom slash Cocktails to learn more about our subscription based service over there. And the only place for official True Crime and Cocktails merch is, of course, TrueCrewMerch.com. So check that out as well if you're interested. Christy, do you want to tell the people about next week's episode? On the next. True Crime and Cocktails, Taste of Patreon 4. That's right, dear listeners. We're going to be giving you a little taste of what we do over on Patreon. A couple examples of bonus episodes that we've done over there uh, in the past. Uh, so you can check it out and see if you've been on the fence. Maybe this will push you into our world. Uh, do you want to, Chrissy, do you want to say goodnight to the people? Good night, my fellow never nudes. Oh, good night, Ryan Reynolds. <laughs>